All right, welcome back to Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 World Tour. We are... I've had a couple rough landings in a row, to be honest. A couple crashes on landings <clears throat> on our last two flights. In fairness, the last one we didn't have an airport to land at. We are just trying to land on this little island super far north in Newfoundland by, <clears throat> by the Torngatton Mountains National Park in the Torngat Mountains National Park. It didn't go so well. If you saw our last video, we kind of did a little flip on our landing. But we're going to say we're, we're good to go now. We fixed the plane. We're, you can see we're up in the air already. And we are ready to continue flying north. We're going to fly across Ungava Bay, probably over Resolution Island, and up to Baffin Island. And eventually we're going to fly across the Davis Strait. I'm not sure how far we'll get today. We're going to at least try to get over Ungava Bay and somewhere up there on Baffin Island. <coughs> it is currently Wednesday, June 8th at 6.44 p.m. And for podcasts to listen to, we've got two Tony Kornheiser Show podcasts. One from Monday, June 6th, and one from today, June 8th. So we are going to start with the Monday, June 6th episode of Tony Kornheiser Show and uh, continue flying here in a second. Tony Kornheiser Show. And one of them was a champagne gummy bear. I thought, geez, I'm in the booth with Bellas. He loves champagne. I like champagne. We both love gummy bears. So we started eating them, and I figured I'd take a picture of it because of all the friends I know, nobody love loves gummy bears. I love the Tony Kornheiser. <laughs> I love gummy bears. I'm so no, jealous. The mixture of gummy bears and champagne made the last hour of the show a lot better. <laughs> The Tony Kornheiser Show is on now. All righty then, we got a lot of things to get to before we get to Michael Wilbon and Mark Feinstein. Let's start with this. Uh, this was mailed on June the 2nd. Today is June the 6th. June 6th, that's right. So this is a few days old. Mr. Tony, long time little, first time email writer. I actually write many emails, but this is my first to the show. You get the point. At around 5.58 Eastern time today, my phone starts buzzing incessantly. While wishing NHL Commissioner Gary Bett, <coughs> excuse me, a happy 70th birthday, you regaled the PTI audience with a brief story of how I, Gary's son, caddied for you many years ago at Alpine Country Club during Dick Schaap's charity event. Actually, 20 years ago to the summer, only highlighting the impressiveness of your memory for an old guy. If I'm not mistaken, you shot okay that day, and I did part with a few clutch. I did my part with a few clutch reads on the greens. Needless to say, this was a big David Aldridge, I know him moment for my friends. Perhaps no one more so than our mutual friend and your podcast guest the other day, Eric Sedransk, who immediately texted me. This confluence of connections made me want to yell the cheesery in glee. This is Gary Bettman's son, Jordan, who listens to the show. How would I know this? How would I know this? we don't embarrass ourselves by talking hockey. <laughs> anyway, while you may want to pull a Billy Bats and tell me to get my shine box, a yardage book, as it were, now I'm all grown up and cordially inviting you to join me with my father for 18 holes of hockey fun at our home course. We can ask Kip Scheman to join us, too, so he can update us on the latest puck news. I believe the Avalanche frosted the Oilers in Game 1. That was the 8-6 game, while the Rangers skated by the Lightning in their opening match. It. Elsewhere in the NHL, he signs it, Jordan Bettman. P.S. The old man says thanks for the birthday wishes. How great is this? Now, Gary Bettman did. Gary Bettman actually called Jimmy Pitaro, the head of ESPN, to get my texting number and sent me a note saying thanks for the birthday wish and yeah my kid caddied for you at Alpine. <laughs> this is so this is like totally insane right yes. totally insane so Fantastic it's great job. to know that jordan bettman is a listener yes i wonder if he's still caddying or has a real job <laughs> he's a good caddy this from lloyd kaufman my classmate at Hewlett high school i wanted to reach out to you about a good friend of mine ira shapiro who has recently published his latest book the betrayal how Mitch McConnell and the Senate Republicans abandoned America. I thought Ira, who lives in Potomac, would be a good guest for your podcast show. Recently, Ira was on Lawrence O'Donnell's MSNBC show, as well as over 20 other radio interview shows talking about his book. He's a big fan of yours. He asked me if I could put in a good word for him. Hope all is well with you and your family, despite these trying times we live in. You know, Lloyd Kaufman. Well, 
I don't do that. I mean, I, it's it's not that I don't like Ira Shapiro, who I don't know. But I'm not going to do a book about Mitch McConnell and the betrayal of the America. I mean, that's just not what we do. Right. If we want to do that, we have Crystal Liz or, or Chuck Todd, you know, and we don't do that. But it's it's lovely. And the fact that he went, Lawrence O'Donnell is famous for... Yeah. Stop the hammering! Stop <laughs> the hammering! That's and if right. Irish Shapiro is a fan of mine, he should call Lawrence O'Donnell right now at his home in L.A. and go, Stop the hammering! <laughs> One more. Len Rubin. Michael, this is a guy who invited us to Montauk Downs. Nice. The guy who went to Snow Hill Camp. The guy who's, you know. It's Len Rubin again. This time I'm not writing about you're coming out to Long Island to play golf at Montauk Downs. That invitation is still there. I'm sure you many Long Island fans would be thrilled to hear that you had made the trek to the sacred ground of the Downs. That's not what this is about. One of my dearest friends has a son who is one of your greatest friends. fans. His name is Peter Sonnenschein. He lives in Philadelphia. He has a rare genetic disorder, familial diasautonomia. I don't know. I, I don't know what it is. It's quite debilitating. He says it's been a struggle for Pete and his family, but they have persevered, and Pete, to his great credit, has become a wonderful artist. He got a real kick out of reading you reading my email on the podcast, and he was so moved that he has done your portrait. I'm sending a copy along with his contact information. Now, if I actually look like this, I belong in a home. <laughs> but it's it's sort of beautifully done in its way. Yes. The coloring is beautiful, and the caricature quality of it is lovely. So I'm really happy to say thank you very much for that. And then that concludes some of our email segment. Nats win yesterday. Nats win the series against Cincinnati. I should hope to God. Cincinnati's the worst team. Yes. Worst team in baseball. They win close in a bunch of games. I'm watching this game last night. They're up one in the last inning. They have Ciszek on the mound because either they've smartly given up on Tanner Rainey or they just wanted to rest him, which is more likely. Yeah, I think more likely. That he wanted to rest him. Ciszek makes you nervous. There's a guy, hey, they all make you nervous. <laughs> there's a guy on first and then, and there's two outs and the leadoff hitter for Cincinnati comes up and he hits a ground ball to shortstop and the throw is late. And it's one of those throws where you're going to challenge the Nats are going to challenge, even though everybody looking at it thinks by a split second, in the tie goes to the runner phase, the runner is going to be safe. Indeed, the runner is safe. Okay, so now you have two on, you have two out in a one-run game in the ninth. Am I saying this correctly? Yes. Bottom of the ninth, two on. And Ciszek, who has a vaguely odd, underhanded delivery, you know, is, is still, he's around the plate. Across the body. He's not walking anybody. It's not like Tanner Rainey. He's not walking four guys or anything like that. He's hittable. Sure. Keyboard Ruiz sets up outside as a right-handed batter. He sets up on the outside. Calls for a pitch to the outside. Whips a throw to Josh Bell on first base. There's a lot of dust but Josh Bell, it seems to me, tags the runner on the hand before he gets the hand to the base. And the runner is called out. Now, at this point, Cincinnati, I don't think they're going to win it, but Cincinnati challenges. Runner out. The inning and the game is saved by this great throw. I mean, an unexpected throw, an unexpectedly great throw by Ruiz to Bell. And so the game ends on two disputed calls at first base. Involving the same guy. One is a hitter and one is a runner. Really weird. Yeah. So the Nats win that game. So do you ever, when, when you watch Josh Bell receive the ball when he's in his stretch, it always looks like his foot comes off as early. he's catching the yes, ball. Yes, I agree with that. I think he's off the base early. You know, because he's trying to sell it. If you get off the base early, you're saying, I already had this. Right. But I think he's off early. Uh, did, you see other the, things. did you see the Phillies game? No. They came back to win. The Phillies did? Oh, yeah. So now they're 3-0 and since three Byron Girardi. Well, we'll talk to Feinstein about it. Harper yeah, having, having some numbers. You know, wow. Um, Billy Horschel and Minji Lee won comfortably in golf tournaments over the weekend. I watched, but they, Michael, not compelling. I, I com- look, the, the Women's US Open compelling for the monster purse that it had and for getting so much coverage across a lot of different platforms. Locally, and for makes, a course I've played. Yeah, the needs. course looks beautiful. Locally, it makes you really excited to try and get out to Congressional to see them in a couple of weeks at the end of June. Uh, Billy Herschel had a, had a tremendous lead, and, and then it was he, the type of thing that once he, yeah, once he got through the front he's nine. He's a steady player. Steady nine, modern pro. Yeah, he's not, you know, he's... Did you hear what his kids called him? It was like they called me like Daddy Horschel. Daddy Horschel, they yeah. call him? That's crazy. Like Daddy Warbucks? Yeah. <laughs> That's sort of crazy. He's got a bunch of children. He seems pleasant. 
um, he's indistinguished from the others. You know, not a great personality, but always dresses very dresses well. beautifully, great shoes. He's got that Ralph Lauren yeah. contract. He, he's, he creeps into putts in a way that makes you a little bit nervous, but he's a very effective putter. Yeah, so uh, Minji Lee crushed it. She set a record for uh, under par in the U.S. Women's Open. What else did I have? Oh, um, Nadal. I am. Nadal and uh, Sviantek won. I never thought Nadal would win. I never thought he'd beat Zverev. But Zverev hurt his ankle and started weeping yeah. on the court. Weeping was yeah. taken off in a stretcher. Wheelchair. Wheel right? Yeah, did you see yeah. the stills of the ankle? How bad? Bad. Yeah. Tore, oh, is it broken? Tore uh, several ligaments. Oh, yeah. I mean... I mean, he went down like... So Nadal, I thought... Nadal was up by one set, but I thought Nadal was going to lose because he'd had two grueling matches before. And then he ends up playing a kid who idolizes him. Yeah. A Norwegian kid named Rud. Yeah, Casper Rud, yeah. And who idolizes him. And you knew that Nadal was going to take him out. Yeah. And took him out in an hour. Yeah. You yeah, know, I mean, and Sviantek took out Coco Goff in half an hour. She's so good. And, and Coco Goff, that's a tremendous run for her to get to the finals. I mean, it's, it's a great for her. breakthrough for her. And she ended up losing the doubles as well with Jessica Pagula. Um, but Jessica Pagula's parents own the, the, uh, Bills. the Buffalo Bills and yes. the Buffalo Sabres. Yeah, and she's, she's having a fantastic year. I think she's top ten. Uh, so she gets second place. Yes. Coco Goff gets two seconds two on seconds. the French. Yeah, but still, Nadal. Last where? The, yeah, glassware is great, but that match in the doll, like that first set tiebreak, um, was he was down, I think six two, and just had some of the greatest shots. Of so his, happy. his foot was asleep. Yeah, his, I know his foot's just, He's got that foot issue that Liz talked about the other day. So happy to have had Liz on. Yeah, to talk about the doll. Don't have to do that again because you know exactly where the show stands because it's where Liz stands. One other small thing: Michael and I played in the father son on Saturday at Columbia. Um, we were not great. We did not get any glassware. We did not place, but I had a lovely time, and I'm so glad you you played with me. Yeah, once again, our moment of not talking happened at the same spot it always does. Instead of happening on number three, the bridges, we waited till number four. We were sitting at a cool one under, and I just needed you from the goldies right. to hit something onto the front of the green right. and maybe just protect the bogey. Uh, I think you were in your pocket as I was tapping in for a smooth five. So I should say this. 72 yard par three. Here is the thing that is important. Whenever Michael needed me most, I failed. <laughs> but you're aware of that. The three, the three holes or so that Michael was out of position, I failed. Really needed you. And 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 mm. it's not like I went first. No, I always go last because I'm playing from forward tees. Right. I failed miserably. <laughs> I failed my child. I did. That doesn't mean I didn't have a wonderful time, right. but I failed my child. But I'm, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> so, but that's, I was thinking about this. The last two times that I've been out, I'm having such a hard time focusing on golf. Because it's, it's a children. It's a, yeah, it's a big month for us. We have school ending, but this is like the, the other side of 35. I just can't get myself to focus. Hmm. Uh, and I need to find a way to, to find, you know, enjoyment in those small moments rather than just being plagued by the fact that you made a seven on that hole. I was terrible. I couldn't get out of the bunker. I was totally terrible. In other news, I... congrats to Walter and Roy Neal. Yeah, they won. Yeah. They won. Walter had two eagles. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, they won. So it's that a big was week just... for big big week for Walter at the Maryland Dam. Maybe I should show up and then try and get in his head like he did to me at the two thousand one Mac championship on the seventeenth hole. It's he got into your head? Uh, yeah. Oh. Well. It was unseasoned at the time. Um I, I failed so utterly. I do it all the it was time. It beautiful morning. It was lovely. Michael birdied the first hole, and I thought we were going to cruise. And I, when I say I thought we were going to cruise, I mean, I wasn't going to help. So I also just I kept hitting it inside 10 feet, but on the wrong side of the hole. So on Roadrunner, on number six, it, there's, it's a tough green to putt back to front. And I have a four and a half footer, and it's like you either make it or it goes by six feet. I mean, I made the part, but you just can't, can't really be aggressive on those putts unless you have a partner. He didn't have a partner. That's the subtext. He didn't have a partner. But I wouldn't trade the moment for anything. Oh, no, no. It's I wouldn't trade it. Yeah. It was great. All right. Uh, can, I, can I read something? You mentioned Liz a moment ago, yeah. Liz Clark. She sent me this this morning. Um, please tell Tony that while on an absurdly long and slow-moving security line at Charles de Gaulle this morning, she was uh, talking with a couple behind her, and a man online, well ahead of her, turned around and said, Wait a minute. Are you Liz Clark? <laughs> Turns out, <laughs> he's from New York and is a huge fan of the show. Loves the show. <laughs> it so bizarre. She does have a distinct voice. It's so bizarre. It's great. And we will uh, come back with Michael Wilbon. I'm Tony Kornheiser. 
You're listening to The Tony Kornheiser Show. This is the Sunday Read. You will never dread doing lawn work again once you team up with Sunday. Their lawn care products are quick and easy. You won't even have to go to the store. Everything is delivered right to your door. Everyone wants a beautiful lawn without those harsh chemicals. That's why this year you should use Sunday. It's made with ingredients that you can actually pronounce, like seaweed, iron, and molasses. And the best part, it works. Does your lawn have weeds or bare patches or pet spots? My lawn has a pet, so yes. <laughs> Sunday can help you solve all of those problems and more the easy way. They've got everything you need from fertilizer to seeds to weed control, and it's all delivered right to your door, right, Michael? Yes. Do you want to describe? Oh, is this now where I get to describe the process? So yes. n- we are trying in between these big June summer storms. We used Lawn Strong last week, which should help us stay green and stay strong throughout these summer months. And again, we got the boys out there doing T-ball. Walker's now graduated where he wants me to do underhand pitching oh, to good. him. Good. So there's a little bit of a rise at the end of our yard. I make him go halfway up so my pitch gets a little bit more movement and he just swings and misses. That's good. Yeah. Torture your child. It's fun. <laughs> Sunday's custom lawn care is effective and super easy. Just go to sunday.com, put in your address. Their lawn analysis tool does the rest. They use soil and climate data to create a personal nutrient plan to live it to your door right when you need it. They come to your house, you attach this thing to a hose, you spray it, that's what you do. And Sunday is offering listeners to this high-quality podcast 20% off. Full-season plans start at just $129, and you can get 20% off that when you visit Get Sunday. Dot com slash Tony at checkout. That's 20% off your custom plan at GetSunday.com slash Tony. Use the code. You're listening to the Tony Kornheiser Show. This is Michael Noah from Singapore. Seven years there, 89 songs later, sending us a new single called This Man. I guess you'd say a prolific avocation. Your podcast has made all the difference during the pandemic, making me feel less homesick for D.C., Hearing you and Michael makes me just a bit envious, both missing the banter with my dad and time together with my grown kids, who are all in the United States now. I know you cherish this precious time together. This is called This Man. It was originally supposed to... It's a lovely song. It is, isn't it? It's originally supposed to play in Michael Wilbon, but what happens is we don't have Wilbon, and the reason we don't have Wilbon is because he's in transit. He's going from San Francisco to Boston, and it's difficult to coordinate and arrange specific times where you can get on the show. It's okay, but this is the sort of second time during the playoffs that this has happened, so we don't want to do this again. I'm looking at Nigel when I say we. We don't want to schedule Mike if, if there's any chance that he's traveling. It just doesn't, it doesn't work, so we're not going to do it. That was a lot of eye contact. Yeah, and I will get to, <laughs> I'll get to the basketball game, and I'll go over exactly how I felt about this game. Um, from the Friday. For those of you who watched PTI, you know that Wilbon was not on PTI on Friday, the day after Game 1 of the Celtics against the Warriors, where the Celtics put together a 40-point fourth quarter and went from being 12 down to 12 up at the end of the game. Another game that wasn't close and late. Another, I'm not going to say a bad game, but another undramatic game in the playoffs in the NBA, which has suffered from a plethora of uninspiring, unsatisfying games. And at that point, Adande, Jay Adande was on the show, and we talked about what would happen next. And we both sort of agreed that if there's one team, and that is a crippling loss for 25 teams, you're at home You have a 12-point lead in the fourth quarter. You're at home. The guy who is the best player on the other team shoots three for 17, Jason Tatum, and you still lose. At home, blow a 12-point lead when their best player isn't good. Devastating. Since most teams reeling. Not Golden State. Golden State has earned... The benefit of the doubt because they've won three championships two with durant one without they're a veteran team the spine of that team green and thompson and curry are veterans if they say it's just one game don't worry about it i think you have to take their word for it this was my point on television that's exactly what happened i watched first half close first half yeah uh warriors didn't look particularly good clay thompson played poorly didn't shoot at all i didn't think I went to sleep, woke up to find out they'd won by 400 points. 
And then in the third quarter, they went up by 15 or 20 or something like that, and they crushed. And so once again, not close late. Once again, a disparate score. Once again, no reason to watch till the end of the game to see somebody dribble it out. What does it mean on the overarching um, theme of the playoffs? Well, we don't know. But here's one thing that we do know. Boston has been a better road team than a home team. They've been better on the road than at home. Yes. They were like 8-2 and two on the road or 7-2 and two on the road until last night. And they've lost a bunch of games at home. So you shouldn't be surprised if Golden State comes in and wins two. One for certain, two. You should not be surprised at that. Golden State, again, a veteran championship team. They can do that. Well, I don't know if they're going to do that. I'm going to wait and see like everybody else. But in my mind, I don't think Boston's going to win them both. You're a Celtics fan. Do you? No, well, they don't handle prosperity well. So if they were win to win game three, that typically after that, they sort of have a down game. So, uh, you know, they, and it's been a frustrating run for them in the playoffs because they just can't seem to put wins back to back. That's right. Um, so, no, That's right. And, and, you know, you saw it from, from the Warriors last night. When they get rolling, you know, they just, they don't miss. Now, the wild card is Draymond Green. Yes. He could have gotten tossed last night. Yeah. He, Draymond Green is a bully on the court. Draymond Green is involved in physical stuff in every single game, and Draymond Green does not care. <laughs> not and when bit. you give him a microphone, he says, I get special treatment, I deserve special treatment. Bad or good? You know, and he doesn't care. No. He cost them a championship a few years back by getting tossed out of a game six. Mm -hmm. He got tossed out of five. He couldn't play in six. They lost. They lost as a result of this. Draymond Green is the most important player in that regard. He, you cannot afford to lose him, and he couldn't care less. So, <laughs> it's so which is difficult. Yes. I think if you're a coach, that's difficult, although I'm sure Steve Kerr loves him. Um, so that was, that was the important part of that game. Boston, Al Horford looked like he was old in this one. Yeah. But you get like three to four days between games. Yes. So that doesn't mean, if, if this was a regular series, with every other day, you'd say you could scratch Al Horford. You'd say he couldn't help you, but he'll be able to come back. When's the next game? I uh, believe Wednesday. Is that when it is? I think it is. Yeah, Wednesday, just, June 8th. Yeah. Wednesday, so yes. Wednesday, Friday, the next Monday. Yeah. yeah. So the Friday game, Al Horford's going to have a difficult time, but the Wednesday game, he'll probably <laughs> be fine. be okay. Does yeah. anybody want to add anything to what I've said? If not, we'll just get out. No, I mean, it was, uh, uh, I think you're right about the, the, the games. They just haven't been great late. You know, there's been these blowouts, and then... That's know, right. And you see just at the end... As opposed to hockey, for example. Right. I, last night, for reasons I cannot even explain, I was going around the dial among two golf tournaments and maybe a baseball game, but no, I think the, I think the golf tournaments may have still been on. And Tampa Bay was playing the Rangers. And I settled in with about two minutes to go of a tied 2-2 game. Two minutes to go. It goes down to one minute. It's now under one minute. Nobody's pulling goalies because you yeah. say to yourself, we'll go to overtime. Under one minute and Tampa shoots and the, and the puck goes to Cistercian's left side into the net. And Tampa Bay wins like 40 seconds to go. Yeah, thrilling. And Tampa Bay wins the game. And you just go, wow, that's close late, isn't it? That's everything you could want in a playoff game because if Tampa Bay doesn't win that game, they go down 3 nothing. Yes. They go down 3 nuts. So now. that's not dribbling out the clock? <laughs> that's not dribbling out the Four clock. Four corners drill. Yeah. No, that's... So that's what the hockey has had. And playoff hockey... And they've had it. Yeah. Playoff hockey is, is always, always a lot of fun. And you do get those games, the overtime games, where somebody scores and you just walk off the, the ice, you know, yeah. but... Uh, hockey yeah. playoffs, great. NBA playoffs, eh, so far. So far. We'll see. Mark Feinstein, when we return, I'm Tony Kornheiser. You're listening to The Tony Kornheiser Show. The Tony Kornheiser Show. This is the trade ad. I'm in love with trade. I'm so happy they're sponsoring. It says, Michael, it says to me, what coffee did you most recently enjoy from trade? What was that coffee? Uh, that was from Orin's. Orin's yeah, in New decaf. York City. Yep. It's a, a, a deep, dark decaf. Just fabulous. It was a big surprise that you liked it so much. I love it. It says, what did you think of the experience? I loved it. Were you surprised by your results? From the quiz. Well, I didn't take the quiz. So I, I took the quiz, quiz for you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's how they got and that's why I was surprised you liked it so yeah. much. 
Whether your friends call you a coffee snob or you just know it when coffee tastes really perfect, Trade's real coffee experts personally taste test over 450 roasts so they know exactly what to recommend for you as they recommended to Michael what I should have. Trade delivers a bag of freshly roasted coffee as whole beans or ground for however you brew it at home and they guarantee you'll love your first order or they'll replace it for free. I got coarse ground to put in a French press. Right. And it's great. Now, how's the water situation? Are you up to a kettle? No. Saucepan. 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 Slow Open boil. yardstick saucepan. <laughs> Slow boil. <laughs> Trade has delivered over 5 million bags of fresh coffee with more than 750,000 positive reviews. And right now, Trade is offering new subscribers a total of $30 off your first order plus free shipping. When you go to drinktrade.com slash Tony, that's more than 40 cups of coffee for free. Get started by taking their quiz at drinktrade.com slash Tony. Let Trade find you a coffee you'll love. That's drinktrade.com slash Tony for $30 off. And don't forget about Father's Day coming up. A trade subscription is the perfect gift for the coffee lovers in your life. I agree with that. I do. You're listening to The Tony Kornheiser Show. This is sent to us by Will James, and he says, I am the principal percussionist of the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra. I've attached a recording of a xylophone rag I recorded several years ago called Girlfriend's Medley, arranged by the great Bob Becker, if you'd like to use it on the show. The work is a medley of three 1920s tunes that all have female names, Margie, Jean, and Dinah, hence Girlfriend's Medley. You remember these tunes, right? I was in high school at the time. I thought about sending in music for the show, but most of my performances happen with the orchestra, to which I have no distribution rights, but thought this solo project I did might be fun to send. The pandemic was difficult for us in the orchestral world. Performing for large audiences was tough to do safely, but I'm very thankful to be performing more regularly. Like many others have said, your podcast has provided a nice distraction from the state of the world, while our normal routine of practicing and performing has been disrupted. He'd like to be the exclusive and official xylophone soloist of the Tony Kornheiser show. And tell Chuck Todd if we have a horn opening, I'll make sure his resume gets through. Will James. Michael, if people like Will James want to send his very interesting and catchy original music in how do they do it i uh, send us your music by emailing it to jingles at tony show.com this guy's a great musician he's the principal percussionist yeah. of the st louis symphony orchestra it's delightful isn't it come on it's lovely mark feinstein joins us i sit at uncle benny's table with a book in front of me the franchise new york yankees a curated history of the bronx bombers by mark feinstein with a forward by joe torrey tell us why you wrote it uh, well, the publisher of Triumph Books, I've worked uh, with them a couple of times on a couple of other books. They came to me, they said, we're starting this new uh, this new series, and we want you to, to launch it with the first one with the Yankees. And I said, uh, well, i got nothing else better to do, so I may as well uh, dig back in and, and go to Yankees history and ruin uh, seven or eight months of my life by writing another book. So when you say a series, are there going to be a lot of books about specific franchises, uh, farmed out to other authors? But that is the plan from my understanding. I believe the Boston Red Sox will be the second one. I know Nigel right. will be interested in that one. <laughs> right. uh, Sean McAdam, my old friend who covered the Red Sox for a long time, is, is authoring that one. Uh, I think after that, they're looking at the Cubs and Cardinals maybe as the next two. So uh, they're certainly starting in the baseball world. And uh, if the series does well, then I would imagine they would branch out to many more. Well, you got to have the Dodgers and you got to have the Giants. Sure. You know, and, and other than that, maybe the Tigers, but you don't gotta gotta after that. You know, there's about eight to ten, you gotta, and then after that, I'm not sure. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, you know, how long is the history of the, the Tampa Bay Rays going to be, right? That can be more of a pamphlet than a, than a book, although I've been yeah. telling our buddy Mark Topkin for a long time, he's covered every game they've ever played, basically. I said, you've been there since day one, you have to write a book about that, but I guess there's also the question of how many people are going to buy a book about that, which, uh, when you talk about Yankees and Red Sox and Dodgers and Giants sure. and Cubs and Cardinals, sure. uh, Big, big historic fan bases who uh, gobble these kinds of things up. Are you a Yankee fan? Were you a Yankee fan? Uh, I was a Yankee fan. I, my father grew up two blocks away from Yankee Stadium, took me there for the first time when I was four years old. I got to see Thurman Munson play uh, just about three months before his plane crash. Uh, so I'm, I'm always thankful that I had a chance to watch him play. He was he was one of those players I liked when I first started. You know, I, I probably talked about Thurman Munson the way Bootsy talks about Juan Soto. Uh, and so, you know, the fact that I actually have pictures of, of me at a game where he played was very exciting. Uh, 
2001 is sort of covering the Yankees, and as uh, you know, and people in our industry know, your fandom gets beaten out of you very, very quickly uh, because you just can't have that emotional attachment uh, when you're sitting in the press box. Where uh, you know, I learned that very hard lesson my first year. Uh, the Yankees went to the World Series. It was a post 9/11 off season or post season, and uh, it was very emotional. It was very exciting. All those huge wins, but then Mariano Rivera blows the game in the ninth inning in Game Seven, and instead of you know drowning my sorrows in a beer like I would have done in previous years, I had to you know figure out what I was writing at that point because everything I had planned on writing was dust. So. Uh, it gets beaten out of you, but my whole family are Yankee fans. My kids are Yankee fans. My father is still a Yankee fan, my wife. So they get very excited when I've been able to do projects like this. Uh, you know, I wrote one a couple years ago on, on the 2009 team, and now we have one looking at the whole history. So they really enjoy this, and so I, I like watching the Yankees with my kids and watching it through their eyes. Did you know George Steinbrenner at all? I covered uh, Steinbrenner probably for about 10 years, I would say about four of which he was still George Steinbrenner as we knew him. Uh, he had his stroke in 2004, so after that he had sort of stepped back a little bit and you start to see the, the sons get more involved. Uh, but I got a few years of that when he would come in the clubhouse and rant and rave, and I remember a game where Pedro Martinez hit Alfonso Soriano and Derek Jeter, and Steinbrenner came into the clubhouse afterwards and was just going crazy and sort of crying about him hitting my guys, and he got very emotional, and I got a little taste of it, but certainly nothing to the extent that uh, uh, that you probably saw in the 70s. Yeah, I, I did a big piece on him for the New York Times Magazine at one point. Um, I enjoyed my time with him very much. I would say that there are a lot of famous owners, um, but in my lifetime, I would say that Steinbrenner and second, maybe Jerry Jones, are important and famous owners, and they've, they've shifted the way their teams have been thought of, you know, that they've, they've had influence far beyond others. People will talk about the Roonies and the great, you know, and they will talk about the Roonies as great men. I don't think anyone will talk about George Steinbrenner and Jerry Jones as great men necessarily. But their impact on the world of sports is, I think, greater than almost any other owners I've ever come in contact with. That's just off the top of my head. What do you think? George Steinbrenner's impact on baseball is probably as large as anybody's impact in the last 50 or 60 years. Yes. I mean, yes. They, they created rules in the league to counter what he was doing. He was the first owner that really sort of seized the advantage of free agency uh, and said, well, if I can go sign anybody I want, I'm going to. And, uh, you know, they a lot of the financial rules that are in place in the game uh, with luxury tax thresholds and all the other stuff were put in as a Steinbrenner, you know, effect, basically. So, uh, you know, and then you look at what he did with the, with the television side of things with signing that huge deal with MSG Network back in the 80s. That was the first time that a team really you know, capitalized on, on local media rights as giving them a huge financial advantage. So uh, you combine that with the fact that he had this uh, almost unhealthy hunger to win at all costs and the fact that he really enjoyed a back page. Uh, he was he was a, a more visible owner and a more impactful owner, not always in a good way, but he That's was right. a more impactful owner than anybody else I've ever seen. All right, let me shift to modern-day baseball. Let me start with something, and we'll start with a Yankee. Uh, Joe Girardi won a World Series as a manager of the New York Yankees. And then he went to Philadelphia, where he was there for two full seasons and a quarter or a third of the next one. And he got canned a few days ago. Philadelphia hasn't lost since he got canned. Can you explain why he got canned and whether this stuff was his fault? I don't know that it was his fault. Why he got canned is pretty easy. Uh, the Phillies were 22 and 29. Dave Dombrowski, their president of baseball operations, is a very win-now type of guy. We've seen that with him everywhere he's been. Uh, and he looked at this roster after adding Kyle Schwarber and after adding Nick Castellanos and said, this team is better than this, and you're not going to get rid of the players. Now, it would help to bring in a reliever or two, uh, but... They just needed a new voice, a new change, and uh, you know they ended up going with Robbie Thompson, who was on Girardi's staff with the Yankees, uh, you know, for many years, predated Girardi in Philadelphia, and stayed on his staff. Obviously, the two of them were very close. Rob Thompson's a great baseball man; he's been in the game almost 40 years. But I think it was more just 22 and 29 is, is a terrible start. But there's some recent history, pretty close to you there in Washington, mm -hmm. 19 and 31 yeah. became a World Series champion. So Dombrowski mm -hmm. thought. 
this team is still capable of making the postseason, especially with a third wild card, but something needs to change, and, and the voice in the room was what he decided needed to change. I don't find myself disagreeing with that. I mean, there are a lot of things that you can pin on Dombrowski. Uh, the bullpen stinks, the defense stinks, and they haven't hit the kind of home runs they thought they were going to hit. You can pin that on a general manager, but when you lose one-run games all the time, as the Phillies were doing, that, to me, Mark, seems like the manager. Yeah, you know, people were pinning the bullpen usage on Girardi, which is funny because when he was in New York, that was, you know, I covered him for, for nine years in New York. Uh, that was one of his strengths. He was always looked at as a guy who really knew how to manage a bullpen. Now, he had much better relievers in New York, and, you know, when you're when you're looking at the first six or seven years of his time there, and he can turn the ball over to Mariano Rivera in the eighth or ninth, uh, yeah, that, that's a nice thing to have. Um, but, yeah, the bullpen usage was a, a big thing in Philadelphia, and I think, uh, you know, Dombrowski probably looked at that, and like you said, something had to change. You can't fire all the players. Uh, maybe you can add a few between now and August 2nd of the trade deadline, but, uh, you know, that voice in the room, and, you know, Girardi always had that look, and I'm going back to his days in Miami, where you'd see him in the dugout and the veins were kind of popping a little bit in his forehead and his neck and he portrayed a very tense um, figure in that dugout and, and I know that was one of the reasons why he was let go by the Yankees. They had a lot of young guys coming up with Aaron Judge and Gary Sanchez a couple other guys and, and Brian Cashman said he, he wanted a more sort of calming figure there that yeah. he didn't want that tension that you could see with Girardi rubbing off on the younger guys. I, I wouldn't be surprised given where their record was if Dombrowski had the same kind of thought in his head of, we want somebody who looks more, you know, like this is all going to be okay. And even when, when Girardi's teams were winning, he still didn't have that look on his face. So uh, that, that could have played into it as well. All right, we got the trade deadline probably a month away coming up on us. Are there names that are being floated out there of people that you think, and it's, it's very often teams like the Nats who have one or two people who somebody else wants and, like a Josh Bell seems to me very, very sought after um, by other teams. Are there names out there of people who you think might be traded? Yeah, you know, I think uh, uh, Bell is certainly going to be one. I think we can we can crush the Soto stuff uh, oh, yeah. now. Yeah, I think right. we've, you know, we Mike Rizzo came out and basically said that uh, recently that, that Juan Soto is not being traded, and I think it would be foolish to trade Juan Soto right now. So let's take him off the table. Um, but yeah, there are going to be plenty of, of big-name players out there. Wilson Contreras, the catcher for the Cubs, he's going to be uh, moved at some point. You know, they had their big sell-off last year, and and he was the one guy they didn't trade, mainly because he had another year of control, and, uh, you know, why not hold on and see what happens next year? But, you know, next year isn't going very well for them either. Um, so I think Contreras is a guy, and that catchers are a little tough to trade, uh, you know, sort of, contender acquiring a new catcher mid-season is tricky because he's got to learn a whole new pitching staff, um, but Contreras is, a, is obviously a, a really good player, and he'll he'll probably be on the move. The Red Sox are going to be a really interesting team to watch because they've gotten off to a bad start. They've played a little better of late, and again, with the expanded playoffs, you know, you look at them, and yeah, they're 12 games out of, uh, of the division, but I think they're actually in a wild card spot right now. So uh, if they decide to move anybody, Xander Bogart has an opt-out at the end of the year, J.D. Martinez is a free agent at the end of the year, those two guys would be very highly sought after. And then there will always be some starting pitchers. Frankie Montas is the one guy Oakland hasn't moved yet. Uh, Luis Castillo has been a trade rumor candidate for, uh, it seems, three years. So the Reds, with the season they're having, wouldn't shock me at all. If he would go, either of those guys would help any contending rotation in the big leagues. Let me get you out of here on this. Max Scherzer got bit by a dog. Now, Max Scherzer is a rescue dog guy. I know this because we both got our dogs. He's got more than one dog. But we both got dogs from the Washington, you know, Animal Rescue League some years back. So I know he loves dogs. And the, one of his dogs bit him on his pitching hand, it turns out. What, what are we hearing about this? Well, yeah, apparently his dog hurt, his, hurt her leg during a run, and he was trying to calm her down, and, and she 
in his hand, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, I guess, he's on the IL. It's not a bad injury, the bite. Uh, he said he, he basically had to skip one day of, uh, of throwing and then, and then started throwing again the next day. So uh, not a huge deal, certainly for a guy who isn't going to pitch for another month or change, month and change anyway. Uh, but it always makes for a cute story. And, and it's funny because the first thing I thought of, David Cohn got bit by his dog uh, on his hand years ago, and he had to miss a start. And because he missed that start, El Duque took his place, and that was El Duque's sort of debut into New York and became a huge piece of that team. So the Mets aren't going to have the opportunity to have some guy uh, come in and and be this revelation because Max Scherzer got bit on his finger by his dog, but it's certainly uh, uh, the tabloids, I'm sure, are having some fun with it. Thank you for mentioning David Cohn because on the cover of Mark's book, The Franchise, there's a quote by David Cohn, a a must-read for any baseball fan. So good. I mean, you'd rather, you'd rather have him give you a blurb than say me. I'm sure. I mean, well, and I must say though, you, your name appears in this book, Tony. We, uh, I, I did a lot of stuff going through the New York Times archive, and uh, I pulled out some some Kornheiser gems. So, uh, you know, for littles out there who want to see a little of Tony's 1970s Yankees writing, it's uh, it's right there. God, I was so bad. <laughs> that wasn't much. Thank you, thank you, Mark. We'll talk soon. Mark Feinstein, Thanks, boys and girls. We take a break. We have email and jingle. When we return, I'm Tony Kornheiser. You're listening to the Tony Kornheiser Show. This is the Indochino read. Whether you're going to be a groom in a wedding party or a lucky guest, everyone wants to look their best for a wedding. With a custom-fitted suit from Indochino, you'll look great, feel confident, and enjoy the big day without fussing over your clothes. You can choose every detail on a suit, a shirt, a dinner jacket, and more at affordable prices that may surprise you for fully custom pieces. Nigel? Discuss your suits. Love my suits from Indochino, and they do make you look great and feel great. If you go into that special event, so like say, I don't know, the Queen's Jubilee, yeah, which yeah. some of us didn't get invited to, but you want to look your best, and you can do that with Indochino. The suits, as you said, are designed to your dimensions. Did it with a rope and a yardstick. You can do it with a tailor. They're very affordable. You can design the suits anyway, and you're going to love them. Every suit is made to your exact measurements. You can, you know... Get options on fabrics and lapel shape and custom monograms, the Union Jack statement linings that (laughs) Nigel has on his three suits. And the best part is that Indochino suits start from just $429 and their shirts from $79. So if you've got a big day coming up, getting the perfect look is no big deal with Indochino. Get $50 off any purchase of $399 or more by using the promo code TONYK at Indochino.com. That's $50 off a purchase of $399 or more at INDO. C-H-I-N-O dot com. Promo code Tony K. Don't be stupid. Use the code. This is the Tony Kornheiser Show. Hello, Mr. Tony. Let me tell you a few things about me that might convince you to give me a shot. Except he says, shoot. I think you got the wrong word there. You got to proofread. That's lesson number one. Read the message <laughs> for intelligibility. Fix the usage so I know what you really mean. Ask your mother. If you wrote erroneously, oh, there's a solution. Why don't you try a proofreader when you write to me? Try a proofreader, cause your grammar is ghastly. Won't you try a proofreader? Maybe then we'll see if you have a me Brilliant. I will speak with them. for Eli Crookshank all summer long. Okay. <laughs> summer of Eli. Let's hold this in case Michael convinces me we should do this. Brilliant. Steve Lipton, Springfield, Let's Virginia. Let's go to the top of this kid's resume. Brilliant. Absolutely. He writes this. It's what does a feature on the Tony Carrasso show. What does a proofreader have in common with a vampire? They both search for typos. That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. That's a brilliant song. Love it. Nigel, do the Bethesda Bagel ad, please. Bethesda Bagels, we love them. You would as well. All you need to do is go to BethesdaBagels.com, for the location in the D.C. area in issue, then pop on in, and you'll be thrilled. Um, that'll do it for us today. Before we get to the mailbag, let me just say, my tears are fallen because you've taken her away, and though it really hurts me so, there's something that I got to say. Take good care of my baby. Please don't ever make her blue. Just tell her that you love her. Make sure you're thinking of her in everything you say and do. Take good care of my baby. One of the great songs of all time. Bobby V, if I'm not mistaken. Bobby V, yes. I don't think V was his actual name, but Bobby V is the guy who took the place of Buddy Holly. Yes. Uh, was going to go to the concert as yeah, from Fargo, and when yeah. the crash happened, yeah. they scrambled yeah. to get a replacement. Bobby V. Yes. 
had a great career, I think. Thanks yeah. to Mark Feinstein. Thanks today. Uh, thanks as well to today's sponsors, Sunday Indochino and Trade Coffee. Remember, you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and Odyssey. If you get show through Apple Podcasts, please leave us a review. Bobby Valeen. Yeah, I knew it yes. wasn't Bobby Valeen. Yeah. TK just... Bootsy 5, there's some great uh, prep performance polos for the little guys. Go for matching Father's Day outfits. Uh, check out the Ace Polo. One other thing I wanted to say, and I didn't, because I, I thought I thought we'd get a chance to talk to Mike, and Mike had travel issues, which is fine. We learned a lesson. One of the things that was important that I didn't mention would get to with him was this is Nadal's 22nd major. He's two ahead of Djokovic now, not just one. It's going to be hard for Djokovic to pass him. 23 is going to be hard because there are young kids coming up. Yeah. It's going to be hard. Makes me happy. I don't like Djokovic. Uh, from Tom Till. Tom Till is from where? Orange, Virginia. I have a couple of Brush with Fame tales I thought you'd enjoy. First, at the Waldorf Astoria in 1944, someone informed a singer who happened to be performing at the hotel that night that an engagement party was going on in the next room. The singer walked over to the party and politely asked the happy couple if they would like a ballad in their honor. The happy couple were my grandparents, and they eagerly accepted Mr. Sinatra's <laughs> kind offer. How great is great that? that? And second, my mother and aunt were at an off-Broadway show in the early 90s. Their tickets put them alongside two other patrons, a quintessential New York yuppie and one Jeff Bridges. Before the lights even dimmed, the yuppie whipped out his bulky 90s cell phone and started calling literally every living soul he knew that he was sitting next to Jeff Bridges in a theater. Finally, my aunt, a quintessential New York violet, who has never once shrunk from anybody or anything, anywhere, ever, had had enough and grabbed his arm. As this is a family program, I will not quote her verbatim, but she hissed what in the Long Island dialect roughly translates to put that thing away, please. <laughs> After watching the whole scene unfold, a very amused Mr. Bridges took my aunt's suggestion as his cue and said, or Jeff Bridges will leave. <laughs> How great is that? From Jamie Opinisano. Opinisano in Hingham, Massachusetts, where Bob Ryan is. Oh, yes. Years ago, when I regularly flew between Boston and New York for work, occasionally I was upgraded to first class, which was a welcome treat, even though one does not get much time to enjoy the benefits of first class on a 45-minute flight. Once, when I was already seated in first class, while the last few passengers were boarding the shuttle from Logan to LaGuardia, I was pleasantly surprised to notice Yo-Yo Ma step through the door with his cello. With only two unoccupied first class seats remaining, I was intrigued to see how Mr. Ma would stow the large instrument. It was clear that Mr. Ma had done this before as he quickly secured the cello in the bulkhead row in front of me, but after he took care of the cello, Mr. Ma proceeded to the main cabin. Imagine my surprise and delight when I looked back to see the virtuoso buckling into a seat in Gen Pop, and I realized the cello would fly first class while Yo-Yo Ma flew coach. Love the show. So Mike O'Connell, regarding your cell service in the house, have you considered having Carol tighten the screws on all the electrical outlets? If that doesn't work, try opening all your doors and windows and shouting representative. I know what I'm talking about. I once flew on a plane with Wi-Fi from Benjamin Bruner in Easton, Maryland. I have two suggestions for your cell phone signal problem. One, buy a new house. Two, offer to have a cell tower put up in your yard with a sign that says, Sponsored by Tony Kornheiser. You'll be a hit with the neighbors and it'll keep the deer out. From Wynn Mossman, I recently sat behind the famous AT&T engineer responsible for increasing cell signals in customers' homes, but you said you didn't want any more famous people stories, so forget it. From Timothy Gombas, have you matched the loss of cell coverage to the phases of the moon? I hadn't thought of doing that. <laughs> something we'll have to work on. From Josh Cromwell, if you can't do your work, there's a simple solution. Just call AT&T and ask them what happened. <laughs> From Christopher Mitchum in the mean streets of Silver Spring. In keeping with the show's philosophy of the connective tissue, I thought you should know that Shade, S-H-A-E-D, a past player on the Tony Kornheiser show, recently opened for some band called Coldplay at FedEx Field at June 1st. It's quite a jump from the time Nigel discovered them down in Georgetown three years ago. Chelsea, Max, and Spencer remember him well. I didn't ask why. Since appearing on the Tony Kornheiser show, they've apparently had a top hit with a song called Trampoline. You won't know it, but your son and your grandchildren will. Appeared on New Year's Rockin' Eve with Jimmy Kimmel. Also did a video with a has-been named Sting. But in no time does their biography mention they also appeared on the TK show. An oversight to be sure. Also, my 16-year-old border collie hates Subarus, but that's for another email. This is from J.H. in Herndon. Can you have a David Aldridge moment with a golf course? When you had Ira Sedrance gone to talk about member for a day, he mentioned Wanamosit Country Club. I said, hey, I know that club. I grew up going to the Northeast Amateur and occasionally played there. I'm pretty sure the statute of limitations has passed on this, but my brother worked on the grounds crew one summer. 
someone was damaging the greens at night, we rigged up a grounds crew cart with a two by four and ran the two culprits into a speeding two by four. When the police showed up, we told them we had no idea how they both ended up knocked out on the cart path. I know I'm going back to an old game, but it was a good one. I'll tell you my story about giving up first class seat to Jerry Rice when he played for the 49ers about a month after that game ends, which is good. And from Sandra Rohde, thank you for having Eric on the show today. Well, this was last week, obviously, highlighting member for a day in ALS. I've lost friends to this horrible disease. In May, Jolene and I enjoyed meeting KJ's mom, Bev, who was diagnosed last year. She sings as beautifully as her daughter. By the way, I have two friends who worked in the corporate offices of Steak and Ale in Dallas, Texas. This came in handy when we visited Ireland and received private tours and bottles, not just drinks, at Jameson, <laughs> Tullamore Dew, Bailey's, and Guinness. I never have enough outlets. We'll do one more. Jay from Columbus, Georgia. No mention of the Binghamton Bearcat baseball team in the College World Series? Come on, man. They traveled to Stanford, probably get shellacked. This is last week in their first game against the Cardinal. Binghamton is 22-28 and 28 overall, but cruised the America East tournament with three wins by a combined score of 35-11. I knew they were going to play Stanford. I don't know what happened. I think had Binghamton won, somebody would have called. <laughs> if you're out on your bike tonight, <laughs> do wear white. Later, he gets the rebound, passes it to the man, shoots it, and boom goes the dynamite. All right, so that's it for the Monday, June 6th episode of the Tony Kornheiser Show. We are moving right into the episode from today, Wednesday, June 8th, as we are flying over... I can't remember what it's called. Let me look it back up real quick. The bay separating Newfoundland from Baffin Island, Ungava Bay fly over Resolution Island, see how far north we get. Fly over Frobisher Bay, up into Baffin Island. So we'll see how far we get, but here's the Wednesday, June 8th episode of the Tony Kornheiser Show. Previously on the Tony Kornheiser Show. Yeah, once again, our moment of not talking happened at the same spot it always does. Instead of happening on number three, the bridges, we waited till number four. We were sitting at a cool one under, and I just needed you from the gold tees to hit something onto the front of the green and maybe just protect the bogey. Uh, I think you were in your pocket as I was tapping in for a smooth five. So I should say that it's 72-yard par three. Here is the thing that is important. Whenever Michael needed me most, I failed. <laughs> but you're aware of that. This is General George Washington, and you're listening to the Tony Kornheiser Show. I went to play golf yesterday morning, and Peter Hicks was there, and he said, I listened to that. It was so sad. Yeah. It was so sad. You I made said, me it's rethink true. my association true. with the game I love. It's all true. I failed in every opportunity that I had, and I always hit after Michael, and all I had to do was hit the ball straight once or twice, and I... I couldn't do it. The, the worst was when we were walking down the fairway when you try and cheer me up. I, I, just, I just want to be by myself right now, <laughs> walking off into the trees. Here we go. This is from Steve Fishner in Kipps Bay, New York. Kipps Bay is in the 30s on the east side, right? That's where Kipps Bay is. Movie theater. Dear Tony, I was going to write about the time I sat next to retired Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor on a morning Geneva to JFK flight while she and I chatted and she drank wine, but something more important happened this morning. My wife, Reva, and I, both proud graduates of George Washington University, were in a super long and numbingly inefficient security line at Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris when I heard an incredibly familiar voice say, I just hate inefficiency. Calling upon my usually useless talent for identifying voices, I surmised that it was a long-time regular on my most favorite podcast. Since it was the day after the men's final at the Paris Open, I felt confident enough to ask, Excuse me, are you Liz Clark? <laughs> After a long pause, she graciously confirmed that indeed it was her. Forget about the Eiffel Tower. Meeting Liz was the highlight of my trip to Paris. Liz said she'd tell you I loved your work for many years, but I'm sending this email in case she forgot. You you talked to Liz about this. She told you this story, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just great. It's fantastic. Yeah. So I have to tell her that we, we got an email from, from the blip she spoke with. This is like getting the email from Gary Bettman's son. Right. <laughs> exactly. Confirming that he got it for me at Alpine. Exactly. Yeah, well, the first three holes are very, very hard. Greg Garcia writes, this is in support of the kid. Dear Tony, D-E-E-R-T-O-N-I. I am writing you to discuss one of your Y-O-U-R-E listeners, Eli Cruikshank. 
At first, I thought it was amusing that you poke fun at the typos and misspellings where he spells miss with four S's <laughs> in his recent email requesting to be a guest on the podcast. But then, as the other littles piled on and wrote in their T-H-E-Y-R-E, fancy good proofread emails and song parodies, B-A-R-O-T-E-E-S, I started to feel bad for young Eli and how quickly he is being discounted. May I remind you of another and the A and the N are separated. <laughs> Another young kid who darkened your Y-O-U-R-E door in his early 20s, spelled wrong, wearing shorts in the winter, breathing from the mouth, and stinking of booze on a Wednesday, <laughs> not even close to Wednesday morning. A graduate of Frostburg with capitals on F and the R, State University, who didn't know the difference between your and your. I'm talking about me, in case you aren't picking up what I'm putting down. Your pal, Greg Garcia from Team Crookshank. It's brilliant. Greg is brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant, as we know. It's brilliant. Love, Greg. Uh, and then I got a very nice note from Peter Sonnenschein. He was the person who uh, Len Rubin uh, sort of guided to oh, us. With a picture. The picture, the portrait of me. <clears throat> and he writes, thanks so much for the shout out of the painting I did of you. This is Peter Sonnenschein. I'm good friends with Len Rubin. He gave me your email. First things first, I love you and Mike Wilbon talking about sports. I watch you guys every night at 5.30 while getting ready for dinner. And he has this disorder called familial dysautonomia, which is called FD, which affects the autonomic, autonomic nervous system that can easily go out of control. Doctors never expect you to live with FD to my ripe old age of 37, and we showed them. My body is unstable. I have numerous medical problems, and I've discovered that drawing and painting can really take my mind off worrying about these problems. I can work for hours, even though I am legally blind. Each of us FDers have to find ways to create stability. This is obviously heartwarming, and I'm so grateful that he listens. Yes. And so kind of him to send a picture and all of that. And... and it's just really nice. And he's got a website with paintings, in case you want to look at it. PeterSonnenschein.com, P-E-T-E-R-S-O-N-E-N-S-H-E-I-N, PeterSonnenschein.com. So thank you for all of that, and I hope people like the work. Uh, what should we start with today? The Angels can't win. <laughs> they didn't win last night after they fired Joe Madden. Yeah, and they were up It's 13 in a row. Yeah. They fired, you know, I, I wrote um, Happy Trails the other day for yesterday's show it had to be changed at three o'clock because he got fired but the happy trails was to mike trout's 0 for 26 because he led off or his first at bat against boston in the game they lost one nothing was a hard single off michael walker okay and i wrote at the end of it guys like mike trout are allowed to play their way out of slumps do you think the same will happen with joe madden and two hours later, Kelleher calls me and said, we got to change trails. They fired Joe Matt. Oh. I said, I believe I had that. <laughs> Nobody knows. It's a question. People are listening now. And so they fired, they fired Matt, who won the World, you know, he won the World Series with the Cubs. We have Wilbon on later. We'll ask Wilbon about it. But he's a heroic figure in Chicago. Sure. Nobody had won in 100 years. He won a World Series. He's a good manager. Yeah, it's great. He's really good with Tampa. Yes. Took Tampa to a World Series. They had no payroll. He's really good. And they got off to a great start in Anaheim for this team yeah. this year. You know, I don't understand. if I owned the Washington Nationals, and I knew that, that Davey Martinez sat at his side for a couple of years in the Chicago organization, I'd bring him in. I'd bring him in. Why not? Now, you can't because they're selling the team, and they're not doing it. But if I were not selling the team, if I was looking to be competitive, I'd bring him in. I don't know why like, people can't win uh, with California. I mean, it's been forever. Yeah. And they have so much talent. You know, Trout, Yeah, Tani, but, but Rendon, Rendon gets hurt all the time. Yeah. That's and so they started to address the pitching. Uh, flip side of your, uh, or, or your point about the Angels, the Phillies can't lose. Can't lose. Fire they Joe Girardi, and they keep winning all the time. Against Hader. You know. Oh, yeah, that's Josh right. Josh Hader, one of the great closers in, in, in the game. Yeah. And the Phillies can't lose. So all that took was getting anybody in there. They brought in Rob Thompson. They, they could have brought in, I don't know, who, who else is out there. You know, Rob anybody. Rob Deer. Rob Dibble. Rob Deere, yeah. yeah, anybody named Rob. <laughs> they could have done that. Don't you think? Yeah. Because uh, that, that team, again, is loaded. That, that, that was the frustration. was like, why? Are we, and you They're better were, than that. Yeah, they, right, you, were just, you were just waiting for the offense to finally click. Yeah. Um, I, I, I need to talk to Michael about this. The USGA, which runs the United States Open, declared yesterday 
while they said their policy might change down the road because the CEO, Michael Wan, said this is a moving target. But for this year, they declared that anybody who was in the U.S. Open is eligible to play in the U.S. Open, regardless of whether they play on the Saudi Golf Tour, which starts tomorrow. No, Friday. Starts Friday in London. Yeah, do the time difference, yeah. So, so this was an enormous victory for the Saudi Golf Tour. And by the way, for professional golfers. <laughs> because now, if they want, they can put their hands out and catch the money. If that's what they want to do. If that's what they choose to do. The PGA Tour, which I believe is a hollow shell, the PGA Tour had not wanted this to happen. The PGA Tour has been threatening to bar, as you heard Steve Sands say the other day, he thought they'd ban them for life. Ban all these guys who went to the Live Tour, the Saudi Tour, for life. Like Kevin Na. Like Dustin Johnson. Dustin Johnson and Kevin Na, they resigned from the PGA Tour. They said, who cares? We're taking the money. Phil Mickelson has not yet resigned, doesn't want to resign. But Michael, what is your read, uh, short term at least, what this does for golf and what do you think golfers will do as a result? Well, I, I think the, the first thing is so many casual sports fans are confused as to who runs what when it comes to golf because you just assume everything that is associated with men's professional golf that starts on this side of the pond is sort of run by the PGA Tour. Oh, no, no, And you no. don't necessarily realize the majors are their own entities. And in many ways, you look at the way the calendar has been shifted uh, with the PGA moving to May, and now you have this condensed major calendar. Uh, as the PGA Tour tries to thwart this off, that condensed calendar sort of goes against them because once these things start to run, uh, they sort of are their own, their own uh, sort of, their own they have their own ground, momentum. Yeah, their own their own ground emotions, uh, momentum here. So, if you look at this, it's a it's an open tournament. Uh, you go back to Tin Cup, and you, the dream of any any driving it's range open. pro qualifying, and you, you see golf's longest day on Monday. The stories of guys who stay around for one final qualifying spot or become the alternate. So. For right now, those guys are able to play. If you have the, if you have the qualifying record, if you have, say, the, the 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 past play to get in, you're allowed to play. But the wording of the USJ's <coughs> announcement made it basically seem like they were trying to tee up a currently conforming golf ball high and let it fly as far away from them as possible, and sort of hoping that this would figure its way out down the road. Uh, right now, the the biggest thing that's affecting players who are going to this other tour at, as they uh, move away from right now the beginning of June is going to be world golf ranking points. Th those are sort of the points that are going to get you They'll into... They'll lose them. They will lose them because there's no real way to, to sort of quantify what and these are not And, the, and these Saudi tournaments are not four rounds. There are three rounds. So it's, it's when you want to figure in... It, it's like if batting averages, you know, if it was a five-inning game, it would be a little bit different. You go, well... What, is that a real game? Is that and even if you could figure something out with that, you might look at strength of field and say, well, you're not playing necessarily against the best players in the That's world. Right. But for the right now, you look at it and go, okay, players like Phil Mickelson, because of his record, uh, you know, in the PGA last year, he's qualified for this U.S. Uh, this U.S. Open and the next upcoming, I think it's five. five Dustin years. Johnson as a past champion. Ten. That's a long time, and those are those are the two biggest names. So if you look at other players who are good enough to say still go through sectional qualifying, uh, that's a that's a big thing. Though they're they are still trying to say their their lack of action right now does not mean that they're trying to show support to any of these other any of these other golf leagues. It came up on the U.S. Open's watch. They thought about it. They knew for months that they were going to have to do something about this. And they, if, if it was up to them, they would pull the covers over their heads and they would do nothing at all. But it does seem to me that when something is called an Open and you qualify, if I qualify for the U.S. Open and you tell me, oh, I, I don't think we can let you in because you played on this other tour last week, I would make a call to Abby Lowell in five seconds mm -hmm. and I would say, get me injunctive relief. This is ridiculous. I qualified. I didn't kill anybody. I went somewhere else and I played golf for a week. I want to be in, and I would be in. I mean, it's, I don't think there's any question about that. The morality question that comes up, there are a lot of columnists who talk about the blood money that you take from Saudi Arabia, a repressive government, a government about which Phil Mickelson said, we know they killed, and it's Khashoggi, the, the columnist from the Washington Post, and we know they execute people for just being gay. These are Phil's words. 
And that those are the famous words in the Shipnuck um, story. They're, they're scary MFers. Yeah, that's right. Right. So you say to yourself, well, you shouldn't do business with them. Okay. And there may be a lot of golfers who don't want to be involved in a term that Michael taught me the other day, sports washing, in which a government like Saudi Arabia uses athletes to cleanse itself from all of these other charges. And some guys, and I can think of Rory McIlroy, might stand up and say, I don't want to be part of that. I don't want that money. But, and there's always a but, the United States government does business with Saudi Arabia. The government. The United States government does business with other repressive countries, such as China and Russia. The NBA is totally invested in China. To ask golfers to do something that the country doesn't even do strikes me as a hard ask. What do you think? Yeah, that's sort of the Taylor Gooch uh, position, because they all these players sat for a Q&A, and they were asked hard questions. Graham McDowell was not... Did not come across in a favorable light. No, he, he just did tried not. again. He just tried to stiff arm and go like, "I'm not smart enough to be a politician." But uh, again, if you look at the timing of this, particularly with uh, inflation, with rising gas prices, with cost of living, and you look at what we might have to do in, in terms of trying to alleviate some of those stresses as we go into the midterms, that's gonna it's gonna change the way we might look at some of those golfers. Yeah. So you know, it's a complicated issue. If you ask me right now, who's winning? I'll tell you, Greg Norman's winning by a lot. Yeah. But in three weeks, maybe he doesn't. I don't know. Yeah, so here's the thing. The, the, the golf tour actually has to start, and you and you look at their team concept, which is a cool concept, and you see yeah. how, how fun that has been for the PGA Tour when they've done that team concept. The names and the logos that they've unveiled are ridiculous. Are they? Really? They're, yes. So it still, it still shows you there is this threshold you have to jump over just to be a real-time sports league. It's not just throwing money on it. You've seen this as they're trying to figure out who's going to be calling the games, and they have uh, the voice from soccer that some of us might know only from Ted Lasso. Uh, but you look at something that's... You can only find it on YouTube and their website. So far. So, yes. So far. So far. So far. You but know, we saw... We when, got time. Yes. You know, and it doesn't matter what happens in the first one if by the second one, they got... Sure. More players and a worldwide television yeah, contract. But if you become the, the laughing stock of the sporting world over well, the weekend, you, you're just going to have to continue to throw more money to try and dig your and, way out of that. And that's right. And I'll give you as an example. Every once in a while, I land on Fox as they are televising the USFL. Uh, All games from the same site in Birmingham, Alabama. And when I say there's nobody in the stands, <laughs> I'm not kidding. There's nobody. there's nobody. Yeah. They don't even want to show the stands. I don't know who's watching these games. That is totally propped up by television. But I don't know who's watching. I don't know how that can continue. There's it nobody there. Doesn't seem possible. I mean, There's nobody there. They, you're right. They don't want to do a wide shot of it because it's just empty seats. There's nobody there. Well, for yeah. Live Golf, they put out these ridiculous price tags for the tickets, and they got slammed for that. And now they've basically been given away. If you do, like, McDowell, Code McDowell, you get I don't tickets. I don't think you have to have... I, I think in golf... I'm not certain you have to have people on the course as long as you have the product on the course. Right. I'm not certain. You can get away with not having people. Think about the best moments when you walk, the, the crowd swell behind the, the winner of the Open, and yeah. they chase the after Tiger. And, but if you don't have that, you need to have a very tight package. Yeah. So, yep. see how it goes. Uh, Michael Wilbon will join us when we return. I'm Tony Kornheiser. You're listening to The Tony Kornheiser Show. This is the Sunday read. You will never dread doing lawn work again once you team up with Sunday. Their lawn care products are quick and easy. You won't even have to go to the store. Everything is delivered right to your door. Everyone wants a beautiful lawn without all those harsh chemicals. That's why this year you should use Sunday. It's made with ingredients you can actually pronounce like seaweed, iron, and molasses. The best part, it works. Michael, you use Sunday. Tell people about it. Yes, and now we are about one week removed from our application of the Lawn Strong, which is going to carry us through this uh, the early portion of the summer. And now with that nice soaking rain from last night, that was nice. you can really it see It rained the last grass. night as well. Yeah. yeah. I didn't realize that when I woke up this morning. I saw it. A good rain for the grass. Yeah. Your yard is your personal oasis. It deserves the best. Sunday helps you grow a beautiful lawn, control pests, and fight weeds without the toxic stuff. Sunday's custom lawn care is effective and super easy. Just go to sunday.com, put in your address, and their lawn analysis tool does the rest. They use soil and climate data to create a personal nutrient plan delivered to your door right when you need it. And Sunday is offering listeners to this high-quality podcast 20% off. 
So a full season plan can start at just $129, and you can get 20% off that when you visit GetSunday.com slash Tony at checkout. That's 20% off your custom plan at GetSunday.com slash Tony. Use the code. Don't be dopey. You're listening, you're listening to the Tony Kornheiser Show. This is a girl named Lucy Koplansky. Her music is sent to us by our friend Michael Granberry, the arts and feature writer of the Dallas Morning News, who sends us only great stuff. It's amazing. He writes that Lucy, as a teenager, moved from her native Chicago, Wilbon, lived in Chicago to Greenwich Village, where she met such aspiring fellow troubadours and friends as Sean Colvin and Suzanne Vega. Not too much later, she enrolled in Yeshiva University, intent on becoming a clinical psychologist. There she earned a doctorate, only to make her way back to what she really loves, which is music. She released the first of nine solo albums, The Tide, in 1994. She's terrific. This is called Elmhurst Queen's Mother's Day, and it plays in Michael Wilbon, Chicago's own. Before we get to anything about sports, how was Matthew's graduation? How was that? It was great. It was great. You know, there's only a small school with Academy Tony. I don't. I, I should know exactly how many kids. I mean, it's, it's thirty something, forty, forty something, and they eat. You know, Joe Powers is just a terrific head of the school. Um, for graduation, as they come up to receive their diploma, uh, each he talks about each kid personally, tells the story about each of the graduates. It, it was just charming. Uh, you know, I flew back on the red eye from San Francisco uh, to get there, and you know, you, I'm not wasn't going to miss the graduation unless you know, United Airlines. I never know whether they're going to come through or not between the actual flight and your luggage. You know, it's about a forty percent equation with with United. But I got back on the red eye and got to go to graduation, and we had a party at the house afterward, and off I went back to the finals. But it was. Uh, it was, it was, it was, you know, tremendous. So Fourteen year olds and all the kids, you know, you know them, you get to know them. You really do because there's so, there's so few of them. You get to know them and their parents. So small, you know, I have ninety two kids in my graduating class fifty years ago, but they got half that, less than about half that. So you really get to know everybody. So does the headmaster just slip them a ten when they get up there, just you know, <laughs> so that, for name, image, and likeness or anything like? Who spoke? Did you speak? Did you speak at the graduation? No, 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 no. I, you know, I, I can, I, you know, between April 15 and June 15, I can barely get anywhere. Okay. So you let's be counted on to, to do anything. And uh, there was a recent graduate uh, who spoke. Uh, you know, it was, it was people at school, Joe Powers, again, everybody in, in the community knows him. He's just a wonderful, wonderful Good. All right. uh, teacher and, 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 and head of a school. And it's just, it, 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 Matthew's been a lifer. He started there in, in Montessori and went through eighth grade. It was just a wonderful experience. It didn't change it. Wouldn't trade it for the world. Now he's going to Gonzaga, which is lovely. Let's go to sports. Yeah. Let's go to two things that interest me other than the NBA, because we'll get to the NBA, and they didn't play last night. And we all know what's going on. They're playing tonight. So let's get to some other things. One of the greatest managers in the history of Chicago Cubs, the only guy who took him to the World Series in 100 years, Joe Madden, fired yesterday by the Angels. Your thoughts? Yeah, I. Uh, that's hard for me. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I don't. The Angels, they don't resonate with me. I don't care about the Angels. But uh, yeah, I mean, when Joe went out there, you think, okay, he's going to have some resources. He got resources. He's going to have a primary player in Trout, and they acquire yeah. Rendon. I know I wasn't counting Pujols last year, but he's left anyway. But wow, what a mess the Angels are constantly. And Joe couldn't fix it. I mean, he had the only one that couldn't fix it. It's been 20 years since they've been any good. And um, so I feel, I feel for Joe Madden. I mean, Joe, look, Joe, Joe's going to be known for one thing in baseball for the rest of his days, for the rest of his life. And that's winning in 2016 with the Cubs. That's it. That's right. I mean, nothing else. There's no encore to that. One of the things, Tony, I think I've told you is that I, I feel this way. And granted, I'm closer to the situation because I'm from Chicago, born and raised, followed these teams forever. But they're two singular teams that will be known for doing one thing. And I think it's all they could do. The 85 Bears, who uh, many people think, I know they weren't undefeated like the Dolphins. They may be the best team ever. Greatest team. They may be. Yeah. They may be. They did nothing else. 
didn't, didn't know him by one year. 85. Right. They got beat the next year after a 10 nothing lead in the playoff game by the Redskins. Right. They got beat the very next year. Get the same personnel, because back then you could have the same personnel. I Jim McMahon might have been hurt, but they had pretty much the same personnel. And in the 2016 Cubs, because they did the thing that was impossible, even harder than the Red Sox, 20 more years than the Red Sox had in uh, 04, in terms of drought. So Joe Madden did that. Joe Madden, you can see Joe Madden like in Chicago on his bike. You know, it's the, it's the, it's the smallest big city in America, Chicago. And Joe could be out on a corner on a rush, you know, um, and he could, you know, sit and have a nice tea with him. <laughs> you know, it's just, it's not, you know, it's still the third biggest city in America, but it's not like the others. It's not as impersonal. It's very personal. And Joe Madden's always going to be a hero there. Always. Yeah. He, you want to see him, he, you could see him taking Tony La Russa's spot, couldn't you? No. No? Okay. No, not really, Tony. That's a good question, though. But La Russa is tied in for decades with the Reinsdorfs. And the yeah, White but he's Sox. 78 years old. He's not going to do it forever. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I hadn't thought, man, I, you know what? I have to ask about that. I, I, I know the people, as you know, to actually ask about that. That's right. That's right. But, but And the White Sox are underachievers. They just are. I'm not saying to fire Tony La Russa. I'm saying to get a plan well, together. Yeah, that's they just, they, But they, they're under chief or so. The yeah. White Sox, to me, could be the most... We could make the case for us talking to one of the baseball scribes. The White Sox is the biggest underachiever in baseball right now. Well, that's possible. All right, let me move to something else. And I know this is very marginal in your life. But there's a greater ramification here. The Olympics are going to declare, they have declared, that you cannot skate in the Olympics if you are under 17 years old. And I know, I'm sure a lot of people are going to say, well, that's great because you don't want pressures on these 15-year-olds and 16-year-olds. Yeah. But Oksana Bayul won a gold medal at 16 yeah. years old. She was ready to go. You know how I feel about going to the NBA. If you're 14 and you're ready to go, I, you know, that's your choice. I think you and I differ on this. I don't like yeah. this rule. I'm okay with it. I'm okay with the age limit rules. I just am. Especially now that I'm the parent of a 14 year old. Uh -huh. No, I'm fine with it. I'm fine with it. I mean, everybody doesn't get to do everything. It's not your inalienable right to compete at 12 years old because they, they're just going to go subterranean. People are going to get to the point where somebody's 13. No, no, 17. I found out by you wouldn't have competed on my, uh, if I was the czar of skating. And gymnastics was the same way, and they put a limit in. They put a limit in. They need to, Tony. It's not even about the performance at the Olympics or the performance at the event we're talking about. It's the culture of these things that put the pressure on people at 12 and 13 and 14. And what kind of environment are they in and where are they left by their parents to practice for 10 hours a day? No, no, enough. No. Okay, all right. Not, not only am I not for it, I am angrily increasingly for the limit. Again, okay. So the we're, on age. Age. Yeah. we're on opposite yeah, sides on that. We're on opposite sides on that. Your thoughts now, as the U.S. Open said to the PGA Tour, stick it. We're not doing it your way. We're not with you. We're going to allow people who have qualified for our tournament, democratically qualified by going out there and shooting a score, we're going to let them play regardless of where they played the week before. What right. do you think this does to the PGA Tour short-term, long-term? What do you think it does with the Saudis short-term, long-term? I don't think it does anything long term because they, they, the PGA seems to have its tackles up and they want to flex and they're going to lose in court, period. They're going to lose. Yes, they are. And it's a restraint of trade. They're going to lose. And the, the, the arrogance of it is just sort of NFL-like. You know, it really is. Uh, and I don't expect to stand it with the withstand anything real seriously with that. And I don't know what it does. So short term to me doesn't matter. Because the moment somebody challenges legally, the moment somebody walks in and says, here's my lawyer, have a chat. It's going to be done. So, you know, case by case, you, you could probably do, uh, with an event like the Masters, it's an invitational. Now that's different. You know, the Masters can do what it wants. Yeah. Oh, the word open. <laughs> you yes, open. That's right. That's right. It changes it. And the open, you know, I don't think it'd be open. You know, the British Open doesn't, won't care about this. Most people are going to be from Europe anyway, it seems, on the Saudi tour. 
I so agree. I agree. I just think, you know, this is a tip of teapot for right now. And it's, I just find it funny that golf, which, you know, in which in this country, its history is rooted in exclusionary practices. 100%. <laughs> just 100%. Like, really? Really? Yeah. No. Are we doing that now? 100% on that. I mean, I could see the, if the, the Saudis money they don't care they don't care mike if you want to announce the live tour they'll give you 300 million dollars <laughs> they don't care that's you right know. you and i you and i should be you know you and i should have looked into that um <laughs> just but I, you know so tony i, I i'm going to uh, first of all who's televising somebody will now I would think yeah, Fox would. For, like well, three minutes. well, I don't mean this no. particular tournament. Well, did, did Greg Norman leave Fox on bad terms or good terms? Because if he left on good terms, Fox would yeah. be the one to do it. But I don't know. I don't know I what guess, happened I there. I guess it could I don't be, know. yeah. Especially the international situation. Sure. You know, it's going to be with Sky TV, right? I mean, don't they have to be Well, I mean, Rupert Murdoch is from another place and That's understands right. global television. Yeah, he does. And understands and understands revenue stream. Yeah, as he, well as anybody. He gets better that. than most. Yeah. yeah. All Absolutely right. Tell. All right. Um, oh, by the way, I got another thing too. Um, we may be on different sides on this one. What's I that? am against positionless All Star teams for the NBA. I am against that. Are you for it? Well, I think I think there's a middle ground. Mm -hmm. I don't like the position. Uh, because it's a positionless game now. Don't tell me I can't have Embiid and uh, Joker and Giannis on the same team. I don't want to hear that. That's, that's, that's lazy. And so, I, even if I'm not for positionless, I'm for front court, back court, maybe. But then okay. where do you go? Back I mean, court. Is just specific question? Okay, I mean... Uh, he's, got, he's got the I ball mean, in his hands 80% of the time on that team. Okay, that, okay, but that's it's not just it's size. It's not just size well, for me. Okay, even if I give... I, look, it's, I'm, it's, it's a complex issue. Where yep. does Giannis go? He's got the ball 80% of the time, but we're not going to argue he's a guard. He's, he's front court. Right, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He's front court. So yeah. we did front court, back court, Tony, which, and there was a move to do that because I voted on these things. I, I, I voted on these things. And, and so I, I'm okay for front court, back court. But pretty soon, yeah, positionless. But, you know, I'm not even for um, seeding by conference anymore. Just seed them. Seed the best teams. Have the best teams play. Now, it's working out this year. It's fine. Because the East is good again. And you can field a team. You know, I'm not even for, I'm not even for West versus East in the All-Star game. I'm for U.S. versus the rest of the world. Yeah. Give me something that would exhibition. Fire some That's fine. Yeah, I don't care. That, 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 I, I'm okay. They can do whatever they want with that. All right, get you out of here on this because I know you got to go to Boston. Um, your position is that Boston has the advantage right now. We'll see what happens in game three. But do you expect Boston to win game three? Tonight, yes. I expect them yes. to win tonight. That's probably okay. right. what happens if everybody comes out healthy. I probably expect probably Golden State to win game four. Yeah. And then, you know, we'll be 2-2. Two -two, yeah. Ensuring a six-game series. Ensuring... We go back to uh, Oakland, which we're going to do anyway, not Oakland anymore, San Francisco. Uh, we go to San Francisco for Monday's Game 5. So that's, I'm expecting a long series, Tom. Okay. Uh, and I'm expecting, you know, the, the, all the angst about Clay Thompson to be a waste of time and Clay Thompson will come out and be Clay Thompson tonight after a couple of rough games. So you, you have rough games in the playoffs because the other teams are trying hard. <laughs> so even Hall of Famers have rough games. And so I, I expect Clay Thompson to be Clay Thompson, something closer to the Clay we're used to tonight. But I still expect Boston to win. By the way, um, people who don't watch don't know this. We had Mark Messier on the show yesterday. Mark Messier has six Stanley Cups. Mark Messier is a godlike player. What did you think? Were you? I was a little starstruck. I have to admit, yes, having him indeed. on the show. Yes. How about you? Yes. 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 Yeah. And the funny thing is, I'm not starstruck by Gretzky anymore because I see you know him so often. Right. I got to know him. I play right. golf with him. You know, yeah. Yeah, Messier, man. The captain. Come on. Yeah. I mean, he went to six. Yeah. And he's got, what, two more than Gretzky? Yes. One, one in so, Edmonton and one in New York. He's got six. If you if you take the Montreal Canadiens' great dynasty in the 40s, 50s, and 60s out of this, if you go to the last 40 years... 50. 
50. Who's got more than six? I mean, you gotta go after LeFleur, you gotta go and Dryden, you gotta go, you gotta go Messi. That's six? Six is a lot. He's imposing looking at the yeah. age. Yeah. It's just, it's just, oh, it's so cool to have had him. Yeah, and he didn't do that yeah. thing like your boy Erlacher getting new hair. He didn't do that. No, man, he stayed, he stayed true to yeah. brotherhood. I like that. Right. Like, I liked him a lot. I'll talk to you later. Have a good time. All right, John. Thanks. Like Appreciate we'll move on, it. boys and girls. Uh, we will come back. Jason Lockenfora will join us when we return. I'm Tony Kornheiser. This is the Tony Kornheiser Show. This is a Simply Safe ad. The break in protection that Simply Safe home security systems provide is great, but it's not always outside forces that you need Simply Safe's protection from. This is Joshua's story, a Simply Safe customer from Indiana. A few months ago, he fell asleep with pizza rolls still in the oven. This could have been disastrous. Thousands of dollars in damages to his kitchen and home or worse. Luckily, Joshua had a comprehensive Simply Safe system equipped with everything to prevent break ins and smoke detectors to sniff out fires. He startled awake to the sound of a 95 decibel alarm from his Simply Safe base station. Seconds later, he got a call from Simply Safe professional monitoring. The pizza rolls didn't make it, but Joshua did. He believed Simply Safe probably saved his life that night. Or as Elton John said, someone saved, someone <laughs> saved my life tonight. Let's talk about the pizza rolls. How come Joshua doesn't tell us, were they Tostino pizza rolls? <laughs> what are the good pizza rolls? Oh, you like the Totino's ones? No, I don't yeah. like any pizza rolls. Are you more of a bagel bite person? Gino's. No, don't like them. Gino's has them. Which one? I mean, <laughs> in terms of full disclosure. Right, we, we need, need that information. Probably yeah, about yeah, Joshua. Protecting people when their guard is down is just one of the reasons more than 4 million people use and love Simply Safe. With a comprehensive Simply Safe system, and 24-7 professional monitoring, you always have someone looking out for you. Plans cost under a dollar a day with no long-term contracts or hidden fees ever. You can customize the perfect system for your home, especially if you're a pizza roll lover. In just a few minutes, <coughs> excuse me, at simplysafe.com slash Tony. Go today and claim a free indoor security camera plus 20% off with interactive monitoring. It's simplysafe.com slash Tony. It's S-I-M-P-L-I safe. Simplysafe.com slash Tony. And in my neighborhood, you see a lot of these. You know, yeah. they, they must be doing pretty well because you see a lot of them. This is the Tony Kornheiser Show. Tony Kornheiser Show. Once again, this is Lucy Koplansky, who says, I came to New York to sing, to be a folk singer. This is Michael Granberry saying what she once told him. It was going really well. When I was 21, I had a really nice write-up in the New York Times, and then I decided to quit, although at the time, I didn't want to be a singer. I wanted to be a therapist. And with the help of her own really good therapist, she made her way back. I'd been too unconsciously conflicted to let myself have what I wanted, she says. And once I was able to see that was what I wanted, I couldn't turn back. The New Yorker once described Lucy as a truly gifted performer with a bag full of enchanting songs. I also liked the description in the Boston Globe, which once wrote Lucy Koplansky, is becoming the troubadour laureate of modern city folk. This is a song called Ten Years Night. She's great. I mean, who's kidding who? She's, she's, she's great. Terrific. Michael, if peace, people like Lucy Koplansky or their good friends like Michael Granberry want to send in their music, how do they do it? Send us your music by emailing it to jingles at tonykornizershow.com. You know, somebody should send me her albums. She's really good. Jason Lockenfora joins us now. We haven't talked about football in a while. We're going to talk about football. And I just before I get to the question I want to get to on Deshaun Watson, which to me is the overriding issue in football at the moment, I, you know, the, the impetus for this is OTAs are starting in mini camps and all that other stuff. And I just saw it today, Jason, and I'll ask you to comment on this. Aaron Rodgers has said publicly that he definitely will play his entire career with the Green Bay Packers. I've got to tell you, I like Aaron Rodgers personally. I'm so sick of Aaron Rodgers yeah. at this point. Are yeah. you? I'm so sick of him. Yeah, it's uh, I can. It's kind of easy to be over him a little bit at this point. Um, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I don't know what that declarative statement means, Tone. Like, he's been a guy who's been saying, I'm, I'm got one foot out the door. I'm for leaving. Wow. Yeah. And he gets a hundred, like 103 million fully guaranteed just in the next two years with the chance to continue to make about 50 a year after that for another year if he so chooses on rolling guarantees. So, yeah, it's good to know that he's quasi-committed to basically finishing his career with Green Bay. Like, that's, that's wonderful news. 
This is, it's Aaron Rodgers who started this whole thing. Yes. It's Aaron Rodgers responsible for all of this. And now Aaron Rodgers is, yeah, I'm going to definitely stay here. And I can even feel him looking at people who ask that, like, mm. what are you, stupid? Of course I'm going to stay here. And you're, whoa, 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 Aaron, you yeah. did this. Yeah. We didn't do that, right? Am I right? Yeah, you can kind of feel the, the side-eye glance or the... Just, so again, this, this guy is... He's got multiple black belts in the passive-aggressive arts. <laughs> he, he has taken that whole mind games thing to another level. Uh, he, yeah. he clearly revels in it. Yeah. It clearly is a part of sort of his... Like, I think certain guys kind of enjoy certain things... To, to kind of lube themselves up for a season or get themselves through a season, right? Ben, ben Roethlisberger was always mythologizing injuries, fake or real. Yes. And sort of basking in the whole, um, it will he, won't he, how bad is it? Like that that stuff, that, that whole, um, the, the chatter about what's next for Ben, I, I think always drove him. And I, I think this guy's got, uh, you know, certainly some stuff going on with him where he wants to act like he is above the fray, oh, yes. and, and he tone he like he, he wants is to act the fray. Like none of this, none of the, this whole like the idea that people talk about me or hang on the on what I say. Like I'm, I'm just naive to all that. Yet at the same time, he completely revels in it. He, he completely is is an unbelievable content generator for the sort of industrial sports media complex. You're 100 um, percent right. He's a manipulator, and I played golf with him. I love. I like him. Yeah. I like him, but shut up with this, right? <laughs> it's, 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 it's a lot to... Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot to take in on a, on a quasi-regular basis. Yes. Right. Um, right. We're, we're less done with would this. be more with him. That's we're right about now. So let me get to Deshaun Watson. More people are coming out and saying yeah. that Deshaun Watson did this to them as well. Everybody knows what we're talking about here. Yeah. If, if these things are true, now maybe none of them are true. Maybe none of them are true. Maybe. But if they are true, if they are true, and there's now 22 women lined up to testify, I guess. If they are true, then at the very least, Deshaun Watson believes that female massage therapists are prostitutes. At the yeah. very least. What? You know, the, the league, I don't know if they can wait on verdicts. I don't know how this is going to work. Doesn't the league have to have a policy on Deshaun Watson? And if it does, Jason, what do you think it will be? Well, this is um, a situation where because of his sort of distorted behavior, his um, seeking out and pursuit of, you know, we, we now have the New York Times saying 66 yes. different um, individuals in the span of less than a year and a half, most of them without um, a significant massage background, right? Many of them just getting into it, just getting certified. Um, his his uh, pursuit of them through unusual means like Instagram, direct messages, what have you, um, he, there, there's something off with him. There, there's, yes. there's, there's serious behavioral issues here. Um, I spoke a lot about the time of this trade and and how um, I found it revolting that these teams are talking about. And it wasn't just the Browns. The Browns are just the one who threw the right num numbers in front of them to get him to look back at them. But the, these teams who, you know, an hour conversation or uh, 90 minutes on Zoom or, you know, an hour with the owner acting as if they had done any sort of real research or digging down into his psyche, what makes him tick, where is this coming from? Um, you know, it, even if you, you just sort of take the, the sexual aspect out of it, like, is he seeking these power imbalance relationships? Is there something that happened to him in his past? Um, that would lead him to do this. What, 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 what does like? Was he trying to get like? Was he trying to get caught at a certain point? Was this some sort of cry for help? Like that, the, the whole sort of um, medical component to this, um, mental health component to this, I just think has kind of been ignored or glossed over. Or these teams just they they wanted to know what they knew and they didn't want to know what they didn't want to know. But but regardless. Because of that behavior, he has put himself in, in a situation where there have been so many of these encounters. And 
you know, that, that just the sheer volume and the nature of this this being a situation where there is no third party who could speak to this or that, right? In, in, in almost all these cases, it's, it's two individuals in That's a room. Right. That's right. Like, I, it's, of course, it's not going to stop. And different people respond to these things in different ways. And some people want to come forward, you know, and and immediately. And some people never want to come forward. And the the, the idea, though, that there is now a, a sort of co- cohort of women who are are amplifying and and confirming these behavioral patterns, Tony, without seeking any recourse criminally. They're not coming after his money. They're not coming after his paycheck. They're not saying he should never play in the NFL again. They're just saying, I, I had to add my voice to this in some way, shape, or form because I experienced it as well. It is not right. And in some cases, they're saying it, it, it absolutely was against the law. And we hope there's there's some degree of recourse here. So, yeah, it's 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 alarming. It's troubling. It's disgusting. And the NFL's personal conduct policy is written in a way that the commissioner and and these other parties who now are involved in sort of informing league decisions on things like this have a tremendous amount of latitude and don't need to to, to have evidence near the threshold of what you would need for. Um, you know, for for a court of law, or or, or um, uh, you know, for for even the civil procedures. So, can they just suspend him indefinitely as more information is is come to light? Do they decide that in lieu of making a declarative statement about his, um, you know, the the outcome of this, we're just going to put him on the commissioner's exempt list? We're going to put him on ice. What yeah, baseball did with Trevor Bauer? And, yeah, and. Yeah. We'll get back to it when we get back to it. When we as, choose to, yeah. As the information comes to light that informs our decision. I mean, look, we, we know we've seen the league do a lot of things over the years where they can sort of make the rules up as it goes along and they are not beholden to any precedent. So, yeah, if the Cleveland Browns were to come to find out that it's more likely than not that he plays no football for you this year, that's that's how it goes. So they, yeah, they, they they knew what they were that they what they were risking by giving up what they gave up and structuring this the way they structured it at a time when there was no clarity about his future regarding the NFL. So let, let's just play this thing out. I, I can't imagine, Jason. I honestly can't imagine Roger Goodell allowing him to play from day one this year. I don't care that he missed all last year. Yeah. I can't imagine that he's going to start the season. And it leads to two questions, and one is a football question and one is not. The first question is, these people who own the Cleveland Browns, who have shown for years their incompetence yes. as owners, how, how could they, how is this playing in Cleveland, in the city of Cleveland? What is the reaction to signing Deshaun Watson? And two, and this is the football part, Baker Mayfield is under contract to them. He, is the, he has been their starting quarterback for a few years. He hates their guts, and they don't like him. What happens to him if they have don't have Deshaun Watson? And again, Jason, maybe I'm wrong. I can't imagine they're going to have Deshaun Watson at the beginning of the season. No, they're not. They're not going to have Deshaun Watson um, at the beginning of the season. There's there's no doubt about that. It, it, there seems to be a mounting backlash in in Cleveland and elsewhere as more people, I think, become aware of of the exact nature of these claims and allegations and charges. And not everybody's going to sit there and weed through, um, you know, this legal document or that legal document. But if you just sort of read some of the reporting that's been going on, and again, the, the New York Times has a tremendous piece um, that today. Jenny Ventress wrote yesterday. And, and you, you, you see what, how, how sort of callous his response is to show him Watson's responses to some of these questions have been um, when he has been deposed, and you 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 sort of um, you 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 compare that to the, the the way these women are telling their stories. I think in the court of public opinion that the pendulum continues to swing. Before, why do we need this guy running out onto a field, being celebrated? You know what I mean? Being being yeah. mic'd up during games, representing the NFL, 
representing the city of Cleveland where he's never spent a damn minute anyway because most of the time he's back in Houston because he's constantly being deposed because he has 23 civil allegations against him of sexual misconduct or in some cases allegations of, of straight out um, criminal sexual activity. Yeah, I don't think it's playing real well there. And you're right to bring up the Haslam's because this absolutely positively only happens in Cleveland with that contract um, and all of the parameters that went into making this happen because the owners desperately, badly wanted it. If they weren't a million percent on board, I got news for you, there is no salesman in the world, there is no general manager or team president or coach who would have the persuasive powers to talk them into it. You don't get talked into something like this when you're the one setting that precedent and putting $200 million in escrow and giving him $230 million fully guaranteed and structuring year one in the way it's structured. So, well, even if it turns out he was he was a pretty despicable guy, he's not going to pay any financial ramifications from it. It's only going to lose a million bucks even if he doesn't play all year. That only happens because the owners are fully on board with it. If they keep going to their football people saying, okay, well, he still doesn't want us, what else could we do to sweeten the pot? What if we did this? What if we did that? But they don't speak to it at all. Kevin Stefanski, the coach, has to wear this week in, week out as new things come to light. And that's, I'm not, I'm not saying anybody should feel sorry for Kevin Stefanski either, but let's just be real about who the face of this transaction is. It's D and Jimmy Haslam, eight days a week, 25 hours a day, all day long, all yeah. week long, yes. all season long, forever. Yes. Yes. All right. Um, the May- the Bay- Baker Mayfield circumstance. Oh, and yeah, there's what happens? That. I mean, it's the same, What's that? It's the same as it ever was. Like, you know, they, they, they've got a payroll now committed to be, you know, I think close to $270 million in a league with an alleged salary cap of 208 So... They're all in financially. Um, no one, none of none of their uh, partners, I'm using air quotes as, as the fellow owners like to call each other, are interested in taking, um, helping him out in any way, or ridding him of this problem unless he agrees to rid most of it himself. Which is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna absorb the bulk of this contract, and then I'll get something in return for this kid. And if it turns out he starts 75% of your games or plays X amount of your snaps, then I'll get something else on top of it. That, that's the only way to facilitate this right now. There, there, isn't, there isn't an active market. I, I think, and a lot of people in the league think Seattle makes the most sense, but Seattle's in, again, no, no hurry to, to facilitate this. Um, and so it sits. And, you know, at, at some point, he's going to not want to be answering, have his people answer questions about Baker Mayfield anymore, and he's going to not want Baker Mayfield to be on his books at 19 million bucks, not to play, but but maybe Ken Lee, you know, is willing to eat 10 or 12 of that to get him out of there and get something for him. And then it'll happen. And until then, you know, he, he, they won't want him around, and he won't want to be around, and we'll keep doing this kabuki dance. Fantastic. I don't normally just have you talk about one thing, but I'm fascinated by it, and I appreciate <laughs> no, your it time on bizarre, it. Bizarre plug situation. You, plug your radio show for us. Thank you, Tone. You can listen to me from 2 to 6 weekdays on Inside Access, The Fan on 105.7, The Fan in Baltimore. You can listen to the Odyssey app. Um, if you are out of market or www.1057thefan.com, um, a lot of, lot of football, a lot of Ravens, a lot of Orioles. We like to make fun of the Nats these days. And we will have uh, stink. former Terps coach Ralph Friedgen on with us at 5 o'clock on this particular Wednesday as he is up for induction into the College Football Hall Good. of Fame. And everybody loves Fridge. Yes. So, yeah, please tune in and thank you for having me, my friends. Uh, by the way, Aiden last night gave up like 10 runs. <laughs> He's 1-10 yeah. in 10 on the year. It's one in ten. They yeah, did, they, did they bother to catch the ball in the outfield last night? I, I must admit, I was watching the Orioles more closely than them. But it's just, yeah, they, it's fun. Like the three days a week, they just decide the fly balls are optional. I, I like that. <laughs> I, I'm very down with that. Thank you, Jason. Jason, you got it, guys. Thank boys you. and girls. Uh, we will take a break. We will come back with email and jingle. I'm Tony Kornheiser. You're listening to the Tony Kornheiser Show. This is the Indochino Read. Whether you're going to be a groom in a wedding party or a lucky guest, everyone wants to look their best for a wedding. With a custom-fitted suit from Indochino, you're going to look great, feel confident, and enjoy the big day without fussing over your clothes. 
Choose every detail on a suit, a shirt, a dinner jacket, and more at affordable prices that may surprise you for fully custom pieces. Nigel, you have three suits. I do. I do. Did you see me at the Queen's Jubilee? You look great. Well, if I had been there, I would have looked great. Standing next to Prince Harry, who also I don't think was allowed there. Certainly, <laughs> Prince Andrew wasn't anywhere near there. You can't have him. There. But if I had been there, I would have looked fantastic in my Indo one of my Indochino suits. They look great. They fit you like a glove because they're, they're tailored to your specific dimensions. You could do it with a yard stick and a piece of rope, or you could go to a tailor. You can design the suit any way you want. I wish I knew his tailor. <laughs> <laughs> it's in where you want. London. Yes. Every suit is made to your exact measurements. You can customize every detail. So create a suit that fits you and your style perfectly. With options for fabrics, lapel shape, custom monogram, statement linings, the American flag, the British flag, the Union Jack, fine. The best part, Indochino suits start from just $429. Their shirts from $79. If you got a big day coming up, getting the perfect look is no big deal with Indochino. Get $50 off any purchase of $399 or more by using the promo code Tony K at Indochino.com. That's $50 off a purchase of $399 or more at I-N-D-O-C-H-I-N-O.com. The promo code is Tony K. Use the code, people. You're listening to The Tony Kornheiser Show. The Tony Kornheiser Show. Here comes Tony's mailbag, got your email faxes and your notes. Here comes Tony's mailbag, gonna read some for all of you Kirsten Olmstead, thank you so very, very much. Nigel, you want to do the Bethesda Bagel ad? Yes, thank you. Bethesda Bagels, we love them. You will as well. We've got the bagel sandwiches today. You just need to go to BethesdaBagels.com for the location in the D.C. area nearest you. Then pop on in and you'll be thrilled. It's almost it for us today. Before we get to the mailbag, let me just say the highway's jammed with broken heroes on a last chance power drive. Everybody's out on the run tonight, but there's no place left to hide. Together, Wendy, we can live with the sadness. I love you with all of the madness in my soul. That's Bruce Springsteen. Mr. Springstein. <laughs> Thanks to our guests today, Michael Wilbon, Jason Lock and Fora. Thanks to today's sponsors, Sunday Indochino, Simply Safe. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and Odyssey. If you get the show through Apple Podcasts, please leave us a review. I, I need to say this about all of the uh, emails we get. We get a lot of emails. I, I've got a backlog of hundreds of emails from years already. I Let's just say 60 come in a day, and let's just say Nigel picks 40 and gives me 40, and then I read 20. I mean, they all, we're so grateful for the emails, but they all don't get read. Yes. It's simple. They all don't get but read. But it's a reminder that even emails that feel great in the moment sometimes have to eventually reach the cutting floor. Yeah. yeah. Shelf life, yeah. Uh, Daryl in Only Maryland, I'd ask you how you're doing, but I know two things. You don't know how to get to your email to read this, and two, I'm not sure you can be banned for life from a podcast. This Sunday, I flew from Baltimore to Denver. As I sat in the aisle seat, I looked over at the guy next to me in the middle seat. I didn't recognize the mid-twenties gentleman with the big headphones, so I asked his name. Steve, he replied. I asked, are you famous? What? Steve replied, I'm trying to meet someone famous on this flight, so I can email the bald orange man who hosts a podcast from his uncle's dining room table that he has out of spite. Steve looked at me, put his headphones back on. We haven't talked since. From Gary Mendez, I've lived a lot of places in my life. I spent about 15 years in Maryland. Well, I've never been seated next to a celebrity on a plane. I've crossed paths with many a celebrity athlete in my day, and a surprising number of them have happened at Camden Yards. I bumped into everyone from Pat Sajak to George Murison to Frank Robinson at Oriole Park. But the best experience was when I scored some great seats just behind the O's dugout for an April game, 2002. Being named Gary, you can imagine my surprise when as I walked to my seat, people started turning and looking and saying things like, great job, Gary, and way to go, Gary. This continued into the game. It took me until about the third inning to realize why people seemed to be looking over my head as they made their congratulatory remarks. I turned around to spot University of Maryland basketball coach Gary Williams, <laughs> was fresh off an NCAA tournament championship just weeks earlier, sitting two rows behind him. Later in the game, as I went off to the bathroom, I spotted Coach Williams out on the concourse, lighting a cigar, and I stopped and I said, Sorry to bother you, Coach. I just want to say my name is Gary and I'm sitting in front of you, so I thought people were talking to me the whole game. He patted me on the back and said, Don't sell yourself short, Gary. You're doing a great job. <laughs> That's <laughs> great. Coach, if you're out there listening, thank you for the pep talk. From Brandon Costello, who used to be Brandon Boker. Yes. Now he's Brandon Costello. I was on a plane once with the band Stillwater, sitting across from you talking to us. We don't even have to go through this. It's a funny reference. It's a funny reference. Come on, from Almost Famous. It's funny. Um, who's this from? 
Ronnie Newmark. Yes. Uh, we did the Beatles tribute with Tom Lofkin last Friday night at Jam and Java. While using the men's room, I didn't notice any celebs waiting and shake hands nearby, but I did spot a This Show Stinks sticker on the wall, photo attached. It stood out among the stickers of the countless bands that have played there and left their mark, as it were. Next Saturday, June 11th, and that's this Saturday, yes. right? June 11th. Yep. If you're in Re Rehoboth, my nine-piece Motown band, Soul Crackers, will be appearing on the Rehoboth Beach Bandstand. That's right in the middle of town. Yeah. That's right by the water. You drive all the way down on Rehoboth Avenue till you can't drive anymore, and that's where the bandstand is. That's fantastic. That's great. Don't expect to find parking. No, um, no they <laughs> no. can't park there. It's the Rehoboth Beach Bandstand from 8 o'clock to 9.15. It's a free outdoor show. You're all on the guest list. That's fabulous. Let's hope it's a nice night. And, you know, and they do well. And, yeah, this show stinks is on the wall. That's great. That's great. And those are the soul crackers. That's good. Uh, Teresa Crant. Didn't we talk about Teresa Crant? Boy, was I shocked while putting a load of clothes in the washer to hear about the knitted leg warmer you received in the mail. Mr. Tony, I'm a little and I'm thrilled that my sweater for the Blue Fairy Penguin, the one that says Penguin Parade Australia across his chest, that usually sits on the PTI set, made it to you. I hope Bonnie can put it on the Penguin and that it fits. I made that sweater in honor of Pengy's 11th anniversary on your PTI set. But more importantly, to thank you and Mr. Wilbon for your wonderful show that has meant so much to me and my family. Congratulations on your 20th anniversary. Michael, I know this was the first sweater I ever knitted, but you called it a leg warmer. Please know that if I had knitted a leg warmer, I would have knitted two, because that's how they usually come in pairs. Please send me your calf size and favorite color, because now I feel compelled to learn <laughs> and knit you a pair of leg warmers. Tony, thanks to you and the crew for the great podcast. I listen to it during the day, and then at night I listen over headphones to fall asleep. Your delivery and soothing voice, nobody's ever said it, to me, <laughs> quiets the ringing in my ears and lets me have a peaceful night's sleep. Very thankful to Teresa Cramp. Isn't that lovely? That is nice. From Michael Wilson in Framingham, Massachusetts. Sean Colella is my cousin, who I'll see this weekend in Saratoga from my aunt's and his grandmother's 80th birthday party. I'll be sure to relay the message of his upcoming NIL deal and exciting changes to his equipment for next <laughs> golf season. That's the kid from Binghamton. That's, yes. I'm not sponsoring that kid. <laughs> oh, well, maybe I'll throw him a 10. You know what I... 10 spot, I sure. Sponsor. Greg Wells, who signs at Dr. Comcast. Why are missing Pennsylvania? Listen to a few shows on Friday. Heard of your cell phone issues. Can't help but notice that the two folks from AT&T went ahead and blamed Comcast. <laughs> sure, the cell service that we have nothing to do with doesn't work. That's on us. I'll just call out that if you had our cell service, you'd have no issues as it automatically connects to our internet. Sounds like Michael got it working, but if it falters again, I'm sure we could accommodate a service transfer. I'll add that whomever you were discussing this Wi-Fi issue with got almost everything wrong. Happy to field questions if I can help. Thank you for being a great customer. This goes in the save bag. <laughs> yeah, we'll save that one. Scott Feist in New Baden, Illinois. How we explain how a phone computer works to a novice, you by an IT system administrator, me. One, turn the device on. Two, the magic happens. <laughs> you welcome. From Lee Gordon, LG, West Hartford, Connecticut, and Boynton Beach, Florida. Dr. Tony, 4G, 5G, you don't need that. You got DG. <laughs> haven't heard from DG in a while. It's been a bit, from yeah. From Natola. Several years ago, the legendary Jen Babish showed me the setting on my iPhone that allows me to use Wi-Fi for phone calls. It's a damn good thing she did because I have since moved to a godforsaken part of northern New England where I have no cellular coverage. Jen Babish. She's good for more than just helping you pick out a new washer dryer. <laughs> Signed Claire Natola, middle of nowhere, Vermont. P.S. Have Michael do these steps on your phone. Setting, cellular, Wi-Fi calling, Wi-Fi calling on this phone. Turn this on. That's what you did. Yep. You know, so thank you for that. And one more from Shea. It's about Max Scherzer's dog. Sit, stay, roll over, and remember, do not bite the hand that feeds you. If you're out on your bite time, everyone is always do wear white. Come on now. That means everybody just cool out. We can cool man. out, everybody. All right, so that's the end of the Wednesday, June 8th episode of the Tony Kornheiser Show. I think what we're going to do is land on this sheet of ice here in between islands and camp out until our next flight. We'll see if I can land this without crashing. Here we go.
All right, we're going to do a little bit of ice camping until our next flight. We will probably start in the air next time as there is no place to take off here. But we will continue on next time on Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 World Tour.